Good evening, ladies as well as gentlemen. I'm Papa Boris, and in this video, I'm going to teach you how to play Suburbia, a board game designed by Ted Alspach? 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 Listen, Ted, I, I'm sorry, I have no idea how to pronounce your name, but this is a pretty good board game. I am going to teach you how to play it with the aid of the iOS app, which was developed by somebody at some point. Anyway, I can't really recommend the app. It's sort of crappy, but we're not here to review the app. I'm here to teach you how to play the real board game so that uh, you can get a sense of what kind of a game it is, decide if you like it, and if so, shell out your money for it, and if not, you know, buy something else that you'll have more fun with. So here goes. This has been frequently described as SimCity, the board game, and that is a pretty apt description, although you should know up front, this is, this is a Euro game. This is a strategy game, so if you love SimCity but you hate strategy games, you're gonna hate this game. But if you like both things, Things, you might enjoy it. At the beginning of the game, each player receives a city that is identical. Everybody starts with uh, suburbs, which are green, green are the residential zones, a community park, which is gray, the gray zones are municipal, and a heavy factory, which is yellow, the yellow zones are industrial. The only type of thing that you don't start with is a blue zone, which are the commercial zones in this game. Now, what's really interesting about this game is the actual, like, turn-to-turn -turn gameplay is very simple. What you do on your turn is just pick a tile, place it in your city, and then, you know, resolve your income and stuff, and then your turn ends. So, the more complicated parts of this game is not the actual, like, turn-to-turn -turn gameplay, but rather understanding all of the indicators of how well your city is doing. So that's what I'm gonna spend the most time explaining in this video. Let's just go ahead and go from left to right here. You have your cash on hand. Cash is used to spend, or cash is used to purchase buildings. And that is the only function that it has during the game. There's nothing else you can do with cash except for buy new buildings. At the end of the game, you get one point per $5. In a lot of board games, that kind of thing is usually a consolation prize. Uh, in this game, it's not too bad of a ratio. You have your income. Income is represented by the numbers inside of circles. At the beginning of the game, your income is zero. This is how much money you collect from the bank at the end of each turn. Then you also have your score. Um, in this game, score is represented by population. This is admittedly not the most thematic aspect of the game. How big your city is pretty much doesn't matter for anything. Like, having more people doesn't mean, you know, you got more people coming to your restaurants or more drivers on the freeway or anything like that. It's just, it's just points. It's just points. Now, one of the many limitations of the iOS app is that you cannot see the full population table, which is kind of a travesty because it's actually really important to be able to see, to see the whole thing. Let me show you real quickly here. This is terribly blurry, and I apologize, but this is a look at the population table in the game. Basically, you know, this is a snaky winding scoring track. So it's like a scoring track in any other board game, except you'll notice it's got these red lines. Every time you pass a red line, your income and your reputation, which I'll talk about in a moment, both go down by one. And you'll notice that this starts to happen with increasing rapidity. So at first, you know, you have to get up to 15 points to lose one. Then there's seven spaces on the population track before you lose your next one. And it's seven again for a few times until we get to here, where it's only six. And then it stays six for a while until we get here. And then it's five. And then it drops to four and three, and then eventually it's just every two spaces you go up, you lose a reputation and an income. So it's actually kind of difficult in this game to get up into the stratosphere points-wise, because there's a negative inhibition, and the more that your population increases, the smaller your income and the smaller your increase in population. So um, you have to kind of work around that, and that's part of your strategy in playing the game. Then you've got your reputation. Reputation is kind of like income, but instead of money, this tells you how many people you get. At the start of the game, everybody's income is zero and your reputation is one, which means that at the end of the turn, you get zero dollars and one point. One person comes to your city. It's a little bit pathetic, so you obviously have to work to improve that. That is one of the important objectives at the start of the game. Now, let's talk about how the actual zones pledge buildings work. Apart from the four different types, the green, gray, yellow, and blue, um, buildings have three main things that you need to look at. So the number on the left with the dollar sign, that's how much it costs to place that building in your city. When you place buildings in your city, by the way, you can place them anywhere where they are adjacent to at least one other building. In this game, placement matters a lot, so like it's important sometimes for buildings to be next to other types of buildings, but not others, as you will see. The thing in the upper right-hand corner of the building is kind of like an instant bonus that you get just once at the time that you buy that building. So when you build suburbs, for example, you get two people. 
and that's it. No, it doesn't do anything else after that. Some buildings, in fact a lot of buildings, also have this band across the bottom middle. This is a conditional effect of the building. This happens when you buy the building, and it happens every other time for the rest of the game whenever it would be relevant. So for example, Community Park gives you plus one reputation. Remember, uh, reputation is the numbers inside of squares. Income is numbers inside of circles. Plus one reputation for each adjacent industrial, residential, and commercial building. So when this thing is built, notice right now it's giving me plus two reputation because it's next to one green building and one yellow one. But if later on in the game I were to build like another suburbs next to this community park, this thing would happen again and I would get an additional plus one. This heavy factory gives minus one for each adjacent municipal building and residential building. So right now it's giving me minus one reputation. But if I were to build more residential or municipal buildings next to it, the minus one reputation would keep on triggering. So this game, you have to have to kind of check a lot of things because there are some buildings that like have effects when other people build stuff or when you build stuff anywhere or when you build stuff that's adjacent to them or when other things happen. So uh, the game comes with a really, really handy, you know, like seven step program of things to check every time you end your turn. You kind of have to like quit alcoholism every time your turn ends in this game because there's so many things to check. And that is one nice thing about the iOS app, but because uh, you know, it takes care of all that stuff for you, but still the real board game is, is very, very much more fun than the digital version that I'm using to teach you how to play it. So those are the three things to keep an eye out. Um, that is it for your city. Then the other main part of the game is the goals. So at the beginning of the game, there's like the stack of 25 gold chips and a number of them equal to the number of players is dealt out to the middle of the board. So this right here, this stuff is randomly determined at the beginning of the game. In this particular game, there's points for having the lowest income at the end, points for having the fewest number of residential zones at the end, and points for having the fewest commercial buildings at the end. But it's not always these three, it's randomly selected out of a stack of 25. Notice, um, I don't know if you can see, because it is a little um, it is a little blurry, and one of the many deficiencies of this iOS app is you can't actually increase the zoom on that, but uh, the number of points that these are worth is actually different. So for the income, it's plus 15. For this building one, it's plus 20 and the fewest commercial building one is only plus 10. So we happened to get a spread in this game. I believe the most you can ever get for one is plus 25, and then the minimum is plus 10. Uh, don't quote me on that. Maybe 20 is the most. I can't remember. At the beginning of the game, each player is also dealt two of these goal tiles at random and chooses one. And that's another rather grotesque omission of this iOS app. This app does not let you choose. It just hands you one and that's the one you're stuck with. So this is my secret goal. The other players don't see this, but at the end of the game, if I have the most industrial buildings, I get plus 15 points for being the industrialist. So the way it works is at the end of the game, most of these goals are just like having the most of something or the fewest of something. In fact, all of them are having the most of something or the fewest of something. So at the end of the game, th that is checked. We happen to have gotten three here that are all fewest, but you could have just as easily got like most income, most residentials, and most commercial buildings. It's, it's, like I said, there's one of each typically. Um, so at the end of the game, it's checked, and whoever satisfies that condition gets it. For your secret conditions, you also check this against your opponents. So if I were to have the most industrial buildings at the end, I would get these 15 points. But if I didn't, no other player could get those points. Um, only I can get that point, so other players can unknowingly shut me out of it, but they cannot take it from me. And again, you get two of them at the beginning of the game, and you pick one of the two to keep, so you have some say in the matter. The ones that are dealt to the players individually, they, they come from the same stack as all the others, so it's not like there's a separate stack for the player hidden ones and a separate stack for the ones that are public. It all comes out of the same thing. So uh, these are really, really important because at the end of the game, you get these points at a time when it doesn't matter like how far you are on this scoring track. So like having, like say you're at 75 points, getting 15 points puts you to 90. So your income and reputation each drop four times. Whereas if you win a, you know, 15 point bonus at the end of the game, this uh, drop in reputation and income is irrelevant. In fact, according to the rules, it doesn't happen. Uh, any points gained from bonuses at the end uh, do not trigger the red lines that they cross. So it's, it's really important, and, and if you ignore the bonuses, uh, you do so to your detriment because they're a really significant source of scoring in this game. Okay, so I think that's it for the player boards. Let's go ahead and take a look at the central board. Shwoop. So when it is your turn, what you do is you build one of the seven buildings 
available for you on this drafting board in your city. To do so, you just uh, take it and you put it again um, somewhere where it is adjacent to at least one of your buildings. So I could put it all the way down here and kind of like snake out. Um, you'll notice at the top, let me zoom out a little bit. At the top, there are these mountains. You can't build up into those, but you can actually like snake around and like you can even, you know, theoretically build all the way out here if you make some kind of crazy wacky city. So that's the, that's the only spatial limitation for how you place your buildings. You can choose any of these buildings that you want to build, but um, if you build any one other than the first two, you have to pay a kind of a premium for taking it earlier. So if I built this mint, for example, I'd have to pay the $15 the mint costs plus an extra 10 for the draft, you know, for the penalty. After you place your building, and I, heck, let's just do it right now. So let's build this waterfront realty here. You pay whatever the building costs. You collect your income, uh, you know, gain your points or lose your points. And then notice, you know, now a new building slides out. So this landfill slid out here after I took the waterfront realty. Now the computer's taking its turn. Here we have Dakota. This is called in the game the charismatic AI. Oh, she's so pretty. And then there's Shelly. Shelly is the traditional AI. Shelby's kind of a boring, uh, a boring Bob, except her name is Shelly. Anyway, so now, you know, each time a player goes, a new tile is going to end up coming out here. So you end up just, you know, running through the tiles. The game ends when the end of round or end of game tile is drawn from deck C over here. And after that, um, the current round ends and everybody else gets one more turn. A round is everybody having taken the same number of turns. So in this game, you actually keep track of who the starting player was. So for example here, um, I being red was the starting player. If the end of round tile were to get flipped at the end of black's turn, then yellow would get to go and that would be the end of the round. And then I'd go, black would go and yellow would go and the game would end. So the game ensures that uh, two things occur. Number one, everybody always gets the same number of turns. And number two, um, everybody gets at least one more turn after the end of round tile is flipped. Depending on the number of players, you place a different number of tiles into the, uh, into the A stack, the B stack, and the C stack. So these are like different stacks of tiles. And not all the tiles are present in every game. So you never know that you'll necessarily see a mint because this could be one of the tiles that is excluded. This adds to the variability and replayability of the game. Um, so you want, you may sometimes want to keep track of like how many tiles are left in each stack. Obviously in the iOS app, you can just see the number, but in, in the face to face version of this game, you'll have to do some counting on your own because it can be important. You know, the game goes actually pretty quickly. A tile is flipped up at the end of every player's turn. So they, we do run through these rather fast. The B's tend to be stronger than the A's. And of course, as you might imagine, the C's tend to be stronger than the B's. Now there may be times where you don't want to buy any of the buildings that are available or you can't because you like, you know, don't have enough money to do that. So you have some other options for what you can do on your turn. Notice there's this, uh, these, these three static piles up here, suburbs, community park, and heavy factory, which mimic the three buildings that you started with. These are always available for purchase. You can always buy one of these. Um, and they're, they're quite cheap. Obviously their effects are sort of crappy. What's important about these things uh, is twofold. Number one, um, they can run out. So here there are just four of each in the middle of the board and it, there sometimes will be like a run on these. They sometimes will run out. So if you do want to get these, you're not necessarily guaranteed to. If you wait too long, your other players, your other opponents might buy all of them out in front of you. The other significant thing about this, and I'll just do this to demonstrate, this is not necessarily a good move to take in the game. Uh, the other significant thing about these is that when you build one, um, you also have to kick out, and you'll see this in just a second, you have to kick out one of the tiles from the drafting row. And when you do, you don't have to pay any money. Like you don't have to pay the cost of the building, but you do have to pay the drafting price. So if I were to kick out, say the office building or this business supply store, I, that would just be free. But if I were to want to kick out the mint, let's say, because I was like, hey, I bet people want to build the mint, then I'd have to pay $4 for the privilege of hate drafting one of the later tiles. So here I am like, oh, geez, I'm so poor. I don't want to do anything. So I'm just go ahead and get rid of this office building. This ensures that even if somebody does not choose to build one of the buildings from the drafting row, that a building from the drafting row is still removed and a new tile is drawn so that the game progresses towards its conclusion. All right, the computer just did something which I'll show you next. Uh, what if you don't even, what if you're like so broke, 
You're doing so bad, you can't even build any of these starter buildings, as cheap as they are. Well, in that case, you still get to do something, which is called building a lake. To build a lake, you take a building, you can take any building from the drafting row, and you flip it over to its other side. So all the tiles in the game have this identical side um, on the back. It's all, they're all called lakes. They are, and a lake gives you $2 for each adjacent industrial, civic, residential, and commercial building. So every building type, except for lakes, uh, gives you $2 if it's adjacent to a lake. And just to recap some of the rules, when you do this, you get the money immediately, but you also get the money later on if more stuff is added next to the lake. Right now, um, I would get $6 for the three buildings that are next to the lake, two for each, plus another six because I have bought this waterfront realty, which gives you an ad additional $2 for um, each, oh my God, which, which makes lakes give you an additional $2 for each building that they are next to. So like this is an example of something that you have to keep in mind. Like if, if I had this waterfront realty up here and I built a lake like all the way at the you know other ass end of town, I'd have to remember that I have the waterfront realty if I were playing the physical copy of this game to make sure that I got my extra six bucks. So lakes um, are always an option because no matter what, you can always take one of the first two drafting tiles and build a lake with it. Like that's something that you literally could never be incapable of doing. So you're never gonna get stuck in this game no matter how badly you play. When you do build a lake, you can, sh it's, it works very similarly to building one of the three starter buildings. So if you choose to build one of these, it's free. If I were to say, turn this tile into a lake, I'd have to pay $4 for the privilege. But you know, but but in, whenever you build a lake, the cost of the building that you're using as the lake is never relevant. And just to show you this, this is again not necessarily a good move, or at like even close to it all, a good move. Um, whenever you build another building next to the lake in the future, the lake gives you money again. So if I were to build this farm here, I would get an extra four bucks from the lake. Two because lakes normally give two dollars plus an extra two because I have this thing that makes lakes give an extra two dollars. Um, and then, uh, you know, that, that would be money I'd get immediately in addition to anything else that would happen to me at the end of the turn. Okay, um, there is one other thing that you can do on your turn. If you can't or don't want to build any of the buildings and you can't don't want to, don't want to build any of the starter buildings and you don't want to make any lakes, there's one other option which is actually kind of significant at times, which is that you can invest in a building. So you have, at the beginning of the game, three of these investment tiles. To invest in a building, you take one of the tiles and you place it upon the building that you wish to invest in. You can, in fact, invest in lakes. And what the investment tiles do is they double the effects of the building, good or bad. So if I were to invest in this farm, it would make me give an additional plus one for every restaurant, but I would also lose an additional one reputation. Uh, if I were to invest in a heavy factory, uh, it would give me an additional income, but it would also make me lose two reputation for each adjacent civic and residential building. So you can kind of think of the investment tiles as basically like buying the building again, because when you invest in a building, you do have to pay the building's cost again. I should have mentioned that up front. So investing in the waterfront realty would cost me six bucks. Investing in the farm would cost me nine bucks. Investing in a lake would cost me zero. Um, so it's kind of like having that building twice, but there is one notable exception, which is that it does not count other buildings' conditional effects. So if I were to invest, for example, um, in the waterfront realty, it would not make my community park give me an additional plus one uh, for having an adjacent blue building. Like it, this, this would still count as just one blue building for the purposes of other buildings counting blue buildings. You know, I would not get an extra $2 from the lake because it's still just one building adjacent to the lake. It's just that its effects are doubled. So I'll show you, you know, this in action. Let's say we invest in the waterfront realty. What this would do is it would make um, me, and now it would now make it so that lakes give an extra $4 instead of an extra $2 for each thing that they're adjacent to, which would cause me to get an extra eight bucks right away. Now you might wonder like, wait a minute, Boris, if you're getting eight bucks, why is your income only going up by four? Well, the reason for that is that I have to pay the $6 that the waterfront realty costs. So I'd pay six, 
Then I would get the eight from the four buildings that I have currently touching lakes. And then I would get an extra $2 from the income. So eight plus two is 10 minus six. And that is where my profit of $4 would come from. You can also invest in lakes, as I mentioned. So that would just cause the lakes to give $4 for each adjacent building that isn't a lake rather than $2. And like everything, this would cause you to get that money right away for every building that is currently touching the lake. But then if you ever built another building adjacent to the lake, you would then get $4 at that time or $6 if you have a waterfront realty, etc. So uh, that's pretty much how the game goes. I'll do another video devoted just to gameplay. I won't finish this game out, partly because I'm doing terrible here, having made some moves for the sake of illustration. But um, that should be all that you need to know. Uh, in order to you know decide if suburbia is a good game for you so thank you very much for watching this i hope you enjoyed it please like and or subscribe if you did and i'll see you next time with some more gaming videos take care everybody